A Visitor at Ashcombe by L. T. C. Rolfe Ashcombe is a fine example of the smaller stone-built manor house, a type in which the Cotswold country of Gloucestershire is particularly rich. I need not specify the precise location of the house, beyond saying that it's not many miles from Stowe on the Wold. The local saying, Stowe on the Wold, where the wind blows cold, is true enough in winter, when the east winds whip across leagues of undulating dry-walled uplands. Yet the stranger who travels in winter along one of the main roads, which stride across these high wolds, obtains a false impression of treeless bleakness, for they conceal within their folds many warm and sheltered combes in which the grey villages and farms lie snugly, linked to the great ridge roads by the narrow, breakneck lanes. In such a sheltered and secluded site stands Ashcombe Manor, protected from the north and east not only by the swell of the wolds, but by hanging beechwoods which flame with colour in autumn. The gabled front faces south down the comb, and the windows, with their stone mullions and hood moulds, look out over a smooth lawn and a strip of unfenced common to the village church. The view is uninterrupted because the lawn ends in a ha-ha, but the road discreetly skirts the edge of the common on its way to the little village, which lies beyond the church. For some years now, the manor has stood empty. Old Mrs. Greening at the lodge keeps the key, and, provided the old lady hasn't stepped down for a gossip or a dish of tea with her sister who keeps the village shop, the house is open to public inspection, with the exception of one room on the ground floor. Empty country houses are no rarity in these highly taxed and servantless days, but, unlike the majority, Ashcombe is of small size and convenient plan, so that many visitors must have speculated on the reason for its desertion. Their curiosity goes unsatisfied. The more inquisitive may discover the belief, held by a few of the older villagers, that the house is haunted, a rumour which frequently attaches itself to an old empty house, and which in this case appears to have no specific foundation, either in fact or folklore. If old Mrs. Greening knows any more than the rest of the village, she does not betray the fact. Ghosts, she will exclaim contemptuously when taxed with the rumour. Oh, I see plenty on em, four-footed uns with long tails. That's all as aunt's Ashcombe. Old Leisha Pert's been telling you the tale down the Penderville, I can see. That old rascal would see old Nick himself for a pint of scrumpy. Other obvious sources of information are not readily available. The present owner, young Dick Penderville, is in the forces overseas, and in any case he's never lived in the house. The last tenants, Mr. and Mrs. Amos Bingley, an elderly, childless couple, are now dead. Amos Bingley was a typical example of the successful black country manufacturer. His career began at the age of eight, when he worked as a bellows boy in his father's backyard chain forge at Cradley Heath. It ended after the First World War, when he ceased to take an active part in the affairs of Messrs. Amos Bingley and Company, chain and shackle makers, and retired with a small but adequate fortune. The sentiment, or more probably a folk memory, derived from ancestors who combined chain making with agriculture in days before the black country was black, had given him a craving for country life, which he was at last able to satisfy by playing the country squire at Ashcombe. He cut a strange figure in this role, a squat figure of uncouth gait, and with a bull neck so short as to convey the impression of stooping, and to conceal from the casual glance the great breadth of shoulder and depth of chest. His enormous hands, obviously better fitted to grasp a sledgehammer than a walking stick, had never lost their calluses, nor his tongue, its broad dialect. He made no attempt to ape the gentry, and while the vicar in the local county regarded him askance, the villagers respected him, for forthrightness is a quality which the countryman has always cherished in himself and admired in others. His fierce Calvinistic piety brought a new lease of life to the little stone chapel opposite the Penderville Arms, and still further antagonised the vicar, who believed that the manor should be the pillar of the church. But, while Amos Bingley may thus be said to have feared God, he certainly feared nothing else. Or rather, he did not do so, 
until he came to Ashcombe. I don't know whether, at the time he took up his tenancy, he heard any rumour concerning the house, but if he had, I don't doubt that his reaction would have been similar to that of old Mrs. Greening, though couched in even more forceful language. In his rough passage through life, he had encountered no power that a hard head or great physical strength could not match. His religion might smoulder with threats of hellfire, but outside the four walls of the chapel he recognised no fires other than the white-hot reality of his furnace flames. It's a strange paradox that after a lifetime spent amid surroundings resembling Dante's Inferno, this tough old black countryman should have met his match in this quiet Cotswold village. Mr. Amos Bingley is now beyond question, but even if time or circumstance permitted, it's very doubtful if he would have been capable of giving any coherent account of his experience. For Mr. Bingley's tenure was briefly, summarily, and painfully terminated. Two years, almost to the day after he first crossed the threshold of his new home, he left Ashcombe in a straitjacket, to die a few months later in Barnwell Asylum. This shocking event was the occasion of much comment in the district at the time. The villagers declared that he'd suddenly lost all his money, and that the shock had proved too much for him. The parson regarded the event as evidence of the perils of non-conformity, while the gentry dismissed a distressing subject simply with a lift of the eyebrows and a significant movement of the elbow. But in fact, the fortunes of Bingley and Company were as prosperous as ever. While although old Amos had been given to drinking bouts in his younger days, he'd grown abstemious with years, for, like many men of his occupation, the chapel had taken the place of the public house. The unfortunate Mrs. Bingley left the district at once and went to live with her sister in Dudley, where she did not long survive her husband. Apart from a few scraps of information grudgingly wrung from old Mrs. Greening at the lodge, our only clues to the peculiar events which seem to have occurred at Ashcombe Manor in the years 1922 and 23 are contained in the weekly letters which Mrs. Bingley wrote to her sister, and which the latter fortunately preserved. It appears that, for the first few months, all went well. Mrs. Bingley's letters describe in detail the process of domestic settlement and rearrangement. It seems that Amos possessed an able partner who was not slow to stamp Ashcombe with the impress of her determined personality. Although the house was already partially furnished, the new tenants apparently imported a great deal of their own with addition. Although the house was already partly furnished, the new tenants apparently imported a great deal of their own in addition, and I suspect that the result was enough to make the dim shapes of the long-dead Pendervelles start from those heavy gilded frames which still hang above the oak staircase. The work of transforming Ashcombe to conform with Mrs. Bingley's notions of domestic comfort was largely entrusted to Mrs. Greening. It is clear that this formidable old retainer was too freely inclined to express ideas of her own, which did not always agree with those of her new mistress. She will keep on with her, old Sir John used to say this, or old Sir John would never have had that until I could clout her, wrote Eliza Bingley. Nevertheless, no serious clash between the two women occurred until, nine months after her arrival, Mrs. Bingley decided to use the arms room. The arms room at Ashcombe is situated at the south-east angle of the building, and on the ground floor. It has one large window facing east, and originally possessed a second, smaller window looking south across the lawn and common to the church. This south window, however, has been blocked up, owing, it is commonly supposed, to the window tax. Whoever was responsible for this alteration was evidently anxious that it should not disfigure the balance of the façade, for the glazed casement has been retained in front of the infilling, an expedient which is quite successful. Seen from the common, the sham window easily escapes notice, and it's only on closer inspection that it becomes apparent that the manor possesses a blind eye. A similar attempt at disguise has been made upon the inside. Here a second casement has been inserted and glazed with mirrors which, by their reflection, effectually lighten the deep embrasure in which the window is set. The effect is curious, the stranger approaching the window obliquely being startled to find himself confronted by his own image. 
In the centre of the panelled wall, directly opposite the mirror window, stands the fireplace. It is surmounted by an unusually rich Jacobean overmantel. Upon this appear, in centre and flanking panels, the arms of the Pendervilles, and of the families with whom they were linked by marriage. Anyone who has been to Ashcombe will appreciate the necessity for this description, because the arms room is not open to inspection by the casual visitor, on the grounds that certain intimate and valuable family possessions are stored there. When the Bingleys came to Ashcombe, the arms room was locked, but it was not long before the indefatigable Eliza, anxious to survey every cranny of her new domain, was rattling the latch at the door. Where was the key? Mrs. Greening grudgingly admitted that it must be down at the lodge. Later, however, she confessed that she must have mislaid it, and in the general turmoil of moving in, the subject of the locked room was shelved. But only temporarily. Mrs. Bingley was not to be put off so easily, and soon, in response to her renewed demands, Mrs. Greening was compelled to find the key. Although the room was quite unfurnished and had obviously been unoccupied for many years, the great fireplace appealed to Mrs. Bingley's ideas of manorial grandeur, and she resolved forthwith that this should be her dining room. Her decision was not without good reason. The existing dining room faced south and west, whereas, she argued, the arms room would catch all the morning sun, and yet remain pleasantly cool and shaded on hot summer evenings. Mrs. Greening, however, thought otherwise, and did not hesitate to say so, in no uncertain terms. Her reasons, that Sir John had never used the room, and that it was a nasty, cold, dark, smelly old place anyway, were not sufficient to deter Mrs. Bingley, and old Mrs. Greening was forced to retire, discomforted, from an encounter which would have cost most servants their place. In fact, like her husband, Eliza Bingley seems to have possessed a will which thrived on opposition. After an orgy of scrubbing and polishing, the arms room took on a new lease of life, and soon the black country chainmaker was sitting down to dine in his baronial hall beneath the carved bearings of his forerunners. The room may have been a little gloomy, as Mrs. Greening had said, but it certainly was not cold. In fact, as Mrs. Bingley told her sister, with a great log fire blazing in the open hearth, it was apt to grow almost uncomfortably warm. But these were matters of little or no account. The feature of the room which caused more concern was an unpleasant smell which was occasionally noticeable. When Mrs. Greening had referred to the room as a smelly old place, she may not have used the epithet in a strictly literal sense, and it was certainly not understood in such a light. Nevertheless, the fact remains that the room did smell. At first Mrs. Bingley identified it as the stale odour of previous meals hanging in the air, owing to inadequate ventilation, and she ordered the window to be opened wide whenever the room was unoccupied. Apparently this expedient proved ineffective, for we soon find Mrs. Bingley tracing the source of the trouble to the fireplace. Some sort of interference between the dining room and kitchen flues was suspected. Builder and sweep were called in, patent cowls were fitted to both chimneys, and the cook was ordered to stop using the kitchen range as an incinerator for scraps of meat or old bones, a practice she apparently denied with some heat, although charged with it on more than one occasion. Yet despite these efforts, the source of the trouble was still elusive. The nuisance was not constant. Sometimes it was unnoticeable, while at others, usually towards evening, the unpleasant odour became so strong that a less determined woman than Eliza Bingley might have abandoned the room. To have done so, however, would have meant admitting defeat to Mrs. Greening, and that she would never do. Even the first curious incidents connected with the mirror window did not shake her stubbornness. Attributing her experience to defective vision, she announces her intention of visiting an oculist in Cheltenham, and in her next letter assigns a similar hallucination of her husband's to the same cause. Whether this explanation really satisfied her, we cannot know. She had had occasion to return to the arms room after dinner. It was the month of February, and the room was lit only by firelight. There was no electric light at Ashcombe in those days. She noticed that the smell was unpleasantly strong, and resolved to tax the cook once more with burning rubbish in the range. As she passed by, she happened to glance into the embrasure of the mirror window, and saw the flickering firelight reflected in the glass. It was only a momentary glance, and it wasn't until she was out of the room that it occurred to her 
that there was anything odd about what she'd seen. Then she realised that as she had crossed directly between the fireplace and the window, she should have seen her silhouette reflected in the mirror, whereas she could swear that all she'd noticed was the uninterrupted reflection of the fire. Her husband's experience a few days later was complicated by another strange feature. Not only did the mirror window fail to record old Amos, but he swore positively and with some force that whereas the real fire had been reduced to a few red embers, the reflected fire burned brightly, so that the room was illuminated not so much by the fireplace as by a ruddy glare which streamed from the mirror. An unpleasant smell and an optical illusion. These were apparently the only incidents which gave warning of the sequel which Mrs Bingley records, ungrammatically and often scarcely legibly, in her last letter. It was only when she was preparing for bed, she writes, that she remembered that she'd left her bag on her chair in the arms room. The smell was stronger than she'd ever known it. But the fire had burned low, and she noticed with relief that no bright glare, such as her husband had described, shone out of the embrasure. It, too, was dark. Emboldened, she determined to dispose of her previous illusion, and, standing directly before the fireplace, she looked into the mirror for her reflection. It was not there. She turned away hurriedly and groped for her bag, but when she repassed the window she could not resist a second glance. This time a dark shape partly obscured the reflected firelight. Her first feeling was one of relief, until, like a child making shadow pictures, she waved her hand and wagged her head idiotically from side to side. The form in the mirror did not move and there dawned upon her with dreadful certainty the conviction that the mirror was no longer a mirror, but a window, that the fire which glowed there was not the fire which burned in the room, that the shadow she saw there was not her shadow. The tables were now turned upon her, for, while terror held her motionless, the shadow began to move. Though the light was too dim to distinguish detail of form or movement, yet both contrived to convey an intensity of purpose which was horribly confirmed by faint scratching and pattering sounds, as if nails scratched upon the glass of a window and clawed the putty from the panes. At this Mrs Bingley recovered the use of her limbs, and in less time than it takes to tell she was back in the drawing-room, trembling from head to foot and obviously on the verge of collapse. Ignoring her hysterical efforts to dissuade him, old Amos Bingley got up from his chair, seized the heavy poker from the hearth in one hand, and the lamp in the other, and set off down the passage. What went on inside the arms room then we can only conjecture. Eliza says she heard the heavy door flung open and then slammed shut with a force which shook the house. This was followed by a prolonged series of sickening thuds and crashes, accompanied by the voice of Amos bellowing inarticulately like an enraged bull. Yet what apparently frightened Mrs Bingley much more was a fainter, sibilant kind of noise which all this hubbub and commotion could not quite drown. Although she could distinguish no words, it sounded, to use her own description, as if someone who'd lost their voice was trying to shout. At length she heard Amos Bingley cry out more loudly than ever in a tone she'd never heard before, and then complete silence fell upon the house. By this time, the cook and the housemaid had joined Mrs Bingley in the drawing-room, but it was some time before the white-faced trio could pluck up the courage to creep down the corridor to the arms-room. They were confronted with a scene of indescribable confusion. The furniture was smashed to matchwood. Even the panelling exhibits to this day the marks of the blows of the poker, which lay in a corner of the room, twisted as though it had been a length of lead piping. In the midst of a welter of splintered wood, crumpled carpet, torn curtains and broken china, Amos Bingley lay insensible, his face a rigid mask of terrified fury. He had evidently been burned by the smashed lamp, for his clothes were smouldering, on his hands were blistered and blackened, as though he'd plunged them into a fire. The sickly stench in the room was intolerable. I have no positive explanation to offer for this strange story, although the following fruits of local archaeological research may possibly have some bearing upon the matter. 
The name Arms Room would appear to be of comparatively recent origin, for in an 18th century inventory of the manor, which the agent courteously permitted me to examine, it is referred to as Sir Neville's Parlour. This presumably commemorates Sir Neville Penderville, 1576 to 1639, who became Lord of the Manor of Ashcombe in 1608, and who was commended by James I for his zeal as a magistrate. From a study of the manorial rolls, it transpires that Matthew Hopkins, the celebrated or infamous witch-finder, visited the neighbourhood in 1637, and that as a result Deborah Golightly, described as an elderly widow living alone at Hobbs Cottage, Ashcombe Bottom, was arranged, tried and convicted of the practice of witchcraft and necromancy. She was sentenced to death by hanging her body to be subsequently burned, these enactments being shortly afterwards carried out upon the common called the Church Common in the parish of Ashcombe.